Today, we're back on our 07 Hemi swapped JK. We're adding rocker protection, new fender flares, a winch, new bumpers, a tire carrier, and making a big upgrade in braking performance. It's all today here on Truck Tech. Hey guys, welcome to Truck Tech. Today, we're working on our 07 Jeep Wrangler, our Hemi Swap JK. And this thing's turning into quite the dual purpose street and trail rig. So far, we've swapped in the aforementioned 5.7 liter V8. It's got a heavy duty aftermarket Dana 44 front axle. The rear axle is a factory Dana 44. It's got a three and a quarter inch lift kit and sitting on some 35 inch tires. But we've still got some work to do. The front bumper is plastic. Not exactly the best spot for a winch, and it's not going to offer up much protection. These plastic side steps, same story. They're not going to offer up much protection. So we're going to replace those plastic parts with some steel versions, something that will protect the body. This is a nice, clean, straight Jeep. We want to keep it that way. So today we're going to add a couple of bumpers, some rocker protection, a winch, a tire carrier, and we've got a big brake kit to go on all four corners. But the first thing we're going to do, swap out these fender flares. After removing a few bolts and disconnecting the wiring harness for the light, you can start prying the flare away from the body. Just make sure you get every bolt. I kind of forgot one. <laughs> now the popping noises you hear when pulling the flare off is the factory retainer clips breaking. No big deal, they're not reused. It just sounds wrong. And any leftover broken clips left in the holes need to be removed. Now we're going to be replacing the factory flares with these flat style fender flares that we picked up from Bushwhacker. But it looks like they might occupy the same real estate as the steel rocker protection that we picked up from Rusty's. Since plastic is easier to trim than metal, well, we're going to install the rocker protection first, just trim the flares to fit. Our new rocker protection is going to cover up the majority of the Wrangler sticker on the side of the Jeep. So we're going to go ahead and remove it with the help of a little bit of heat. It softens up both the adhesive and the sticker, making removal a little bit easier. Now to get rid of any leftover adhesive stuck to the body, a little bit of WD-40 on a rag takes care of that. After mocking up the rocker protection and locking it in place where we want it, we can go ahead and mark the holes that need to be drilled. The holes that are accessible on the back side of the sheet metal will get a through bolt, a nut and bolt. The ones on the back side of the tub it's going to get a bolt and a threaded insert into the body. The inserts and the special tool needed both come in the kit. It's basically a threaded rivet, and by tightening the bolt down, it's causing the insert to clamp down around the surrounding sheet metal, leaving a nice new bolt hole. Now the rocker protection is going to leave some silver painted sheet metal exposed on the bottom. So we're going to paint the bottom few inches of the tub with a black wrinkle spray paint from Duplicolor. That'll help the rockers blend in nicely. Before laying down the paint, we had to do a little bit of prep work. So we gave the surface a little bit of tooth by using a red scuffing pad and then wiped everything down with some prep spray and a Scott Pro shop towel. Then we could go at it with the paint. Now this does take a few different layers. They recommend going in three different directions with three medium coats. This stuff does take a while to dry. They recommend 24 hours, but we're cheating a little bit and force drying it with a heat gun. And it's cool to see the texture pop right out of the paint. And if you do happen to get a little bit of overspray on the body, well, cleanup's pretty easy. Yeah. 
then it's simple as bolting the rocker protection into place. Now the fasteners are stainless steel, so a little anti-seize will prevent thread galling. With that done, we can move on and finish up the fender flare installation. Starting with reinstalling the original splash shield. It's going to get trimmed and reused, basically marking it flush with the body. If it sticks out too much, the outer flare won't go on. If it doesn't stick out enough, well, it won't tuck behind the new fender flare. We're using our Matco air saw to make quick work of the excess plastic. Then you can install the Bushwhacker inner fender pieces. They get fastened down using the holes that the plastic retainer clips came popping and cracking out of. You don't want to tighten down the bolts too much. It'll deform the plastic. And you want the inner fender pieces to ride along the body line of the fender. Then you can reinstall the trimmed inner splash shield and cut off the connector to the factory marker light and add on a couple of the connectors supplied in the kit. And like we told you earlier, we are gonna have to trim the flares to fit around our steel rockers. So after marking it, we use our air saw to trim away about a quarter inch of plastic. Then we added the rubber trim that goes in between the flare and the body for a nice finished look. Then you can plug in the wiring for the new marker light. And it's a good idea to test to make sure it works before fully committing to the installation. If need be, just swap the wires around. Then, using the supplied screws, simply attach the flare to the inner pieces. Now, where we had to cut the fender flare to fit around the rock protection turned out pretty good, especially once we added the rubber trim. And the last step is pulling off this liner so the rest of the rubber trim sticks to the fender. Up next, we'll get our new winch and bumpers installed. There we go. And later, we're stepping up to 13 and a half inch rotors. Stay tuned. Quite the difference. Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Now we've had a chance to install our Bushwhacker flat style flares at all four corners and we swapped out the plastic side steps for some steel rocker protection on both sides. But now we're ready to throw a few more parts at this thing, make it a little bit more ready for the trail. Now, like we mentioned earlier, we want to add a winch to the front of our Jeep, but that plastic street friendly bumper isn't the place to do it. We wanted a steel bumper and something with a lot of clearance. So we checked out the latest offerings from Mickey Thompson and their metal series line of bumpers just for the JK Wranglers. And these are modular line of bumpers. Now the center section is obviously the main section and it features heavy duty D ring tabs. It's powder coated black and holds the optional winch tray. Now there's also three different options for end caps. There's a flush end cap that, as you guessed it, fits almost flush with the center section. There's a stubby end cap and a full length end cap that more closely mimics the stock bumper. And the stubby and the full length caps feature rock light ports in case you want to do a little night riding and need to see obstacles a little bit better. There's also two options for winch guards. The low guard, what we went with, and the stinger. Speaking of winches, Check out this worn Xeon 8S, meaning it's got an 8,000 pound single pull rating and the S signifying that it uses synthetic winch rope instead of steel cable. And with that rope, well, you need to use a polished aluminum Haas Fairlead instead of a roller Fairlead, which would tear up the synthetic rope. Now, this is a low profile design winch, but you can make it even better by moving this control pack elsewhere on the vehicle to lower the profile even more and maximize airflow into the grill and hopefully keeping our V8 cool. Now, the plastic factory bumper really isn't a bad idea if you're only going to be using your Jeep on the street. It's light and less weight equals better fuel economy, so I can see why they do it. But if you're going to be using your Jeep off-road, well, something a little bit more substantial is probably in the cards for you. Step one of the installation is installing these nut plates into the pockets on both frame ends. That'll provide a mounting location for the winch tray. Now, I'm running a couple of bolts in from the front just to help locate and index the winch tray until we tighten down the side bolts. Then we can remove our indexing bolts. We follow that with the installation of our new winch, which sits in the bumper or winch tray really nicely. Then we tighten down the hardware that was supplied with the winch. Then we can wrap it in a bumper. Now I'm using our Kundal crane to help position the bumper, but it's really not that heavy. So if you've got a friend, it's pretty manageable to line things up and get it bolted in place. Now all the hardware is supplied in the kit and it's all good grade A quality hardware.
just make sure you position the bumper where you want it before you tighten down any of the bolts. All right, now the only thing we've got left to do to finish up the installation of the winch is to make our power and ground connections directly to the battery. Now the winch sits nice and low in the bumper. I like that a lot. It doesn't look like it's going to impede airflow at all, even without relocating that control pack. And the stubby end caps on the bumper will allow the tire to roll up to an obstacle without the end caps of the bumper getting in the way. It's nice to have on the trail. Now the rear bumper is a Mickey Thompson Metal Series bumper as well. And just like the front, it's got rock light ports on either end of it. It's also designed and engineered to work with the OEM receiver hitch. We also went with the optional swing out spare tire carrier. It'll give us a solid and sturdy mounting location for our relatively heavy 35 inch spare tire. The rear bumper, just like the front, comes off with just a few bolts. Then we can get a couple of the supporting brackets out of the way along with the factory spare tire and the spare tire carrier. Now the third brake light assembly needs to be kept. It gets reused on the extended third brake light portion of the new tire carrier. Magnesium. Next, we're installing the rear bumper brackets. Now the bolts that thread into the side of the frame are only getting snugged down for now. This template will help us line up and drill the holes along the bottom of the frame. I've got it clamped into position so it doesn't move around on me. Then it's time to drill three holes. I'm starting out with a quarter inch drill bit and working my way up to five eighths. Our Ken Cut drill bits make quick work of a rather labor intensive task. A little spray paint on the exposed metal will keep corrosion at bay. And with that knocked out, then we can install the rear bumper bracket for good along with the spare tire carrier support bracket. Both sides done, it's time to hang the bumper. There we go. And once you've got the bumper lined up with the body lines, you can tighten down all the bumper bolts and add the spare tire carrier. That's super tight. Then we bolt on the door plate and rubber bumpers into the factory tire carrier location. After the break, oh wait, breaks are actually after the break. Yeah, that's right, stick around. Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Well, the installation of our rear bumper and tire carrier is complete. You've got the spare hanging off of it, the third brake light is relocated, wired up, and working. But one thing we hadn't talked about was the high lift jack mount that we picked up with our tire carrier provides a convenient mounting location for something that's almost an off-road necessity. And despite all the extra weight hanging off this thing, the swing out function looks nice and smooth. Now, like we mentioned earlier, we've got a brake upgrade planned for this Jeep, and it only makes sense. We've added a lot of horsepower, a few hundred pounds worth of body protection and heavy duty parts, not to mention the extra rotating mass of the larger 35 inch tires. But it's not a simple brake pad and rotor upgrade this time. We wanted a serious improvement, so we went with a big brake kit for all four corners from Bear. We picked up our 13 and a half inch Pro Front brake kit from Rusty's Off-Road Products. It's obviously a 13 and a half inch rotor. It's drilled, slotted, and zinc plated. The front calipers are massive. They're good looking six piston calipers, and these are a serious improvement over the stock hardware, and everything's designed to bolt right to the JK spindle. The rear kit is their S4 kit uses a four piston caliper and is engineered and designed to work with the factory parking brake assembly. Now, when doing an installation like this, well, it's always a good idea to make sure you test fit your parts. Once you install them, you own them. Now, the minimum wheel size for this big brake kit is 17 inches, and they're designed to work with most aftermarket versions. Ours? Yeah, they fit without any problem. We're in good shape. Now, the factory JK brakes aren't bad but there's definitely room for improvement. And the last guy that worked on this thing put some anti-seize in between the rotor and the hub mating surface. It's part of the reason it came apart so easily. And when installing new rotors, it's always a good idea to make sure the mating flange is good and clean so the rotor sits nice and flat. That'll prevent any unwanted rotor runout or shimmy. Now the bolts holding the caliper brackets in place got treated to a little medium strength Loctite. Torquing these the recommended 120 foot-pounds. 
This ring here is supplied in the kit, and it's what locates or centers the rotor on the hub. And again, a little bit of anti-seize, make sure disassembly happens without much trouble. Now, time for the big rotor. Shiny red caliper. And if you're trying to match your calipers to an accent color on your vehicle, well, Bear offers over a dozen colors so you can find something that matches. And don't forget the copper seal rings that go in between the banjo bolt and your existing brake line. Done. Sock versus the 13 and a half inch replacement. Quite the difference. Hey guys, welcome back. And we've got our bare brakes installed at all four corners, and they look really good behind the spokes of our Mickey Thompson wheels. Now the rear brakes went on just like the fronts, the only difference being a small amount of trimming to the rear dust shield for caliper bracket clearance. Now once we get the brakes bled, we've got a pretty comprehensive rotor seasoning and brake pad bedding procedure to follow, just to make sure we get everything out of our new brakes that we should. Once we're done with that, we should be experiencing a pretty substantial improvement in braking ability for this 4,000 plus pound Jeep. Now with the fender flares on here, winch, bumpers and side protection on, well, we're just about at the finish line for this Jeep and all the parts we've been throwing at it, but we've got a few more left. Our Dana 44 up front is empty, so we're going to be filling it with an air locker and 456 gears. Now the factory 44, well, it's not empty, but it's getting the same air locker and matching gears. We've also got a couple of installation kits, a high output air compressor, and a heavy duty diff cover to throw at this thing. Once these parts are on, well, we can finally take our modified Hemi powered JK out and see how it performs on the street and some pretty tough trails. We got some work to do. Now, in case you guys don't remember the second chance Silverado, it was an 01 Chevy 1500 that we picked up for cheap. We fixed some pretty serious crash damage on it and added a few bolt-ons to. But that was about five years and 100,000 miles ago. Since then, the truck has obviously been used regularly, and the driver's seat can prove it. The leather is dried out, cracked and splitting. The armrest, seat back, bottom and bolsters are all torn up. But we can fix this interior with a few products from Covercraft. And with the seat covers in place, you can see how good they look. Now they're made with the Carhartt duck weave fabric, so they're breathable and water repellent. And if you do happen to get them dirty, we can just clean them in your home washer and dryer. Now the material is overlapped at the seams and then double and triple stitched for strength and long lasting durability. Covercraft's premium custom floor mats are available for the front, rear, cargo area and trunk area of most vehicles. There's 11 different color options to choose from, and there's optional logos and monograms available. We like the Truck Tech logo. Now these seat covers and floor mats breathe a little bit of life back into this 200,000 mile truck. So if you've got an older pickup and the interiors are a little bit rough from hauling the family pet around or just work, well these Covercraft products may be what you're looking for. And if you've got a new truck and you want to keep it looking that way, well they'll solve that problem too. Guys, thanks for watching Truck Tech. See you next time.